welcome. My name is Richard Perham. I'm your compere for today's celebrations. Our next Community Event of the Year award goes to the Save Urco Estate campaign, and it was nominated by Jack Carnegie from the Newtown Neighbourhood Centre. Over a period of five months, public housing tenants in Erskineville and residents combined forces to oppose the redevelopment of the Erskineville public housing estate. The redevelopment would have seen this garden estate demolished and replaced with high-rise buildings. The residents would have been moved off the estate for up to two years and the number of housing units on the site was to increase from 146 to over 400. However, there would have been no increase in the number of public housing units as the additional ones would have been for private sale. The Save Urco Estate C Committee was a community building exercise in itself, comprising half tenants and half residents. The combination of public housing tenants and yuppies fighting together was a unique experience for all involved. And as you know, they won. And to accept the award for the Save Urco Estate campaign, we have Jenny Barron, Jan Flanagan, Veronique Jones, Dominic Quigley, Sue Smeaton, and Tad Tietza. It was a great honour to achieve this award. It was a short, sharp campaign, and I agree entirely with what Tanya said earlier, that it is actually our duty. It, it's, it's our right as Australian citizens to get out there and fight things. And if you do fight, you will win. The next community event of the year winner is the Save Erskineville Public School campaign. And this again was nominated by Jack Carnegie from the Newtown Neighbourhood Centre. The campaign to save the school was waged over two years and involved many people within the Erskineville community. The plan was to close the school and relocate the kids to Alexandria under the government's Building the Future plan. Though the school is small, the quality of education is high and is loved by students, parents, teachers and the community. The campaign involved a protest outside Parliament, public meetings, a high-profile media campaign, submissions and an appeal to the Ombudsman. The campaign committee, headed by Jenny Mulvey, was creative and energetic and never gave up the fight even when the appeals process was exhausted and the minister said it was over and the school would close. Another example of a, good, a local campaign winning against the odds. And representing the Save Erskineville Public School campaign, we have Cathy Calverley, Francis Cusack, Adrian Jerram, Dev Mukherjee, Jenny Mulvey, and the principal, Ms Gay O'Neill. Would you put your hands together and welcome them all to the stage. period, I guess, of the long campaign that we had, we did have the support of South Sydney Council, both the councillors, the mayor and the staff, and we'd like to thank them for that. Um, we also, like the Save Erskineville Estate campaign, had the support of the whole community. And Erskineville and South Sydney are a wonderful community to be part of, and um, I think it's important that we acknowledge the values that are being uh, recognised here that citizens can be, can participate in their communities building and developing those communities, and that's very important. Thank you. The first thing that 200 odd people who live in this searching building Welfare Estate heard of the proposal to bulldoze it and build multi high rise or whatever multi rise mixed economy places was about a month ago and uh, that stunned people and uh, so they called a meeting, the Housing Commission called a meeting at the Newtown Neighbourhood Centre, conveniently divided into four separate sections, divide and rule if you like. So some of us got out a little leaflet called The Revolt of the Mushrooms, in which we presented an alternative position. When we got to the meeting, there was an agenda which says, welcome an overview, the regeneration project, questions and answers, representatives for future meetings, and so on. Not a word about discussion or, you know, and so on. So we had to, some of us had to move in a bit. 
And I started off reading this letter out from Joan, who's a very 80-year-old uh, lame woman who looks after her 98-year-old mother. And she wrote this, and she said, Dr. Rev Shorgi should be asked to visit the ghetto-style estate at Erskineville, see report Sydney Morning Herald July by so-and-so. Rather than be called a problem area, the Erskineville estate could be promoted as a good style of public housing. Residents are singles, couples, families, all ages, from babies to seniors, many nationalities, and get along harmoniously and keep our surrounds tidy. They do not need regeneration or gentrification. Contented citizens should be more value to governments than financial gain. I was living in Rochford Street when they built these places, or was building them, and uh, my sister, they were open for inspection, and my sister said to my wife, let's go and have a look. So they came across and had a look, and they said, very nice, very nice. So put in an application form, and they said, OK. So we moved here and been here ever since. Been the only tenant that's been in this flat, and I'm still living here. I moved in here in 1939, the end of a big depression that we have had a very big depression. I watched this place being built. This place was a great park that went from the corner of Binning Street right down to Mitchell Road. No Elliot Avon go you going through it. That was built after these flats started. And they were built by the government. A man came out from England and his name was Mr Lucas to watch the building of these flats. And a woman by the name of Miss Ramage come out from England to pick the tenants who would go in. And before we were picked to come in here, our home had to be inspected to see that we were worthy. So I was a picked tenant. I filled in the form because it was my idea to come down. My husband was happy where it was down there. Anyway, I filled in the form and I picked for the place and they then inquired about, took the form to inquire about my husband working and they discover that he's only working half time. So they tell me that I cannot have a flat because he's only they don't know that I'm working at this stage. They'd say I can't have a flat because my husband is only working half time. But then I come out and I say, well, I am working. And between the two of us, we could pay our way. And because we could pay our way, we were allowed to have a flat. Well, I was really horrified when I was informed in Broken Hill that I was going to Erskineville. I originally was from Sydney and I, my housing officer in Brighton Hill said, well, could you just go over and have a look and see? Because I was coming for medical reasons and I had to be close to Prince Alfred Hospital. But I've never regretted coming here. Oh, I'm very happy uh, to live here because uh, before I moved uh, to this unit, I live at, uh, in Newtown, and Newtown is quite a small room for me. I was slightly distracted this morning by this, um, this filming business, which we've been asked to um, incorporate into this morning's wow. proceedings uh, at the request of some of the residents, and um, I'm very... Uh, Happy that uh, this is happening, but a bit unnerved by it. So, uh, the master planning process is a, a sort of statutory process that we go through, and we put a, an application into council to approve that. So, anything that, that we propose has then to be approved by council, and it goes out for another period of statutory consultation where you again have a, 
and then a period where you can make comments. Isn't it not true that housing can, um, the council can, is asked to comment on the plan but cannot veto it? In practice, we go through the normal channels of um, negotiating with council in the same way as any, any other applicant would. But with, with, with the provision that if the minister doesn't like council's decision, he can over, over rule. I understand that that's the case if um, push comes to shove, yes. You're, you're saying that if the council with it is not happy with what the department proposes, that the, then the government will take planning control away from the council and exert their will? It would be an unusual situation where an application was called in by the Minister's office. That's, that's not, my understanding. That's not that unusual. I think, um, with, with respect, with this issue uh, is, is something which is way down the track and we're here this morning to do some detailed looking at the site and, and get your input, so I'll, I'll just move on from that point. No, I see Frank the other day indicate very clearly that, all right, you could feel at ease because when he was given the presentation, he indicated that, after all, the council would have a say. Now, it was very, that was taken on the first meeting, and I listened to that and I knew that's not right. The Minister has got the overriding power and he will exercise it. There's a whole range of specialist consultants reports that we'll be getting in parallel over the next couple of months. You're not going to be um, seeing any construction work on this site for around two and a half to three years. That's what we think it'll take before any work starts on the site. So those of you who have been very concerned that you might have to move in the short term, please don't worry about that. But today we're here to for your input into the master planning process and I'm going to introduce Catherine Young from Stanisich Associates. Our brief from the Department of Housing is to prepare a master plan and that's based on criteria that's been set out by the Department of Housing. Firstly, that involves replacing all the existing housing stock that's currently on the site um, and it also involves improving the quality of the housing stock that's on the site. That has been raised because generally there's a feeling that the population on the site is becoming an elderly population and the housing stock that's currently there doesn't meet the specific needs of this group of people. So we'll be looking at that in our master planning. So in terms of replacing the housing, we'll be looking at introducing a range of ageing in place housing as well as general housing, as well as some private housing on the site. But I cannot understand how you can, as promised, return everybody who wants to come back to this estate and as well have private housing or private um, rental mm -hmm. accommodation without turning it into a high density area. Part of the reason why this is such a good area is that it is not high density and we have a very good community here. You put people close up when you get, I'm sure that the people from the department know that when you've got people cheek by jowl all over the place, that's when you get problems because you have people with drinking problems, mental problems, other kinds of you know, violence and various things and they're too close together. What's the role of the heritage architect? The heritage architect is going to be conducting a study of the existing buildings on the site. So to identify the heritage significance of the buildings. But you've already decided that the buildings are to be demolished? No, no. Sorry? We're, that's, we're, we're employing a heritage architect to tell us if, there's, if there are buildings of significant heritage value on the site. And then the decision, if, the, if there are buildings that are identified that need to be retained or converted for future uses, then that's something that the heritage architect will have input into. The site that we're looking at includes the residential buildings up on Swanson Street, the residential buildings on Ashmore Street and the bowling club that we're currently in. It includes the Lady Gallery Childcare Centre. It includes the little playground that's just north of the bowling greens. There's actually a lot of pressure in this area for development and you can see that by the different developments that are happening around the site. You have two stations that are quite close to the site. Um, as well as King Street, which is a fantastic main street. It's one of the best main streets in Sydney, in fact. And Erskineville Road itself, which still has a very traditional sort of village character about it. And then as you move down Swanson Street, there's a row of eucalypts along there that doesn't really contribute to um, a streetscape as such. 
And then the buildings that are there, as you can see here, they turn their backs away from the street and look onto Elliott Avenue or onto the courtyard. So there's just blank wall. I've always been involved, uh, someone said, once said, sticking your nose in everybody's business. But I've always been active and uh, I joined the Labor Party because of that. And the Labor Party was always interested and they were particularly interested at the time about this. So I was 12 years on the South Sydney Council and five on the city. That was 17. Loved every day of it. People are built as the Housing Improvement Board. Very shortly afterwards, the state government took over. Tubby Stevens came out and opened them, and uh, that's about 1938, I think, he officially opened these flats. So from there on, we just went on daily. I went to work and so forth, and then we got to know the neighbours, and we, uh, we had a wonderful lot of neighbours. Uh, they'd built the Lady Gary Child Centre then. We used to hire the hall and have dancers up there. We'd uh, organise picnics and we'd all go together out to a picnic. Wonderful neighbours we had. We'd play cards, my turn tonight, somebody else's turn the next night. And we were very, very good neighbours, very, very good friends, got on very well together. And uh, so it just went on from there on and uh, I don't know, I just started to get older, of course. I can understand the government looking at all this land I mean, fantastic drop of land, and I mean, we are so lucky we can look out every window and <laughs> see greenery, greenery. That's why my, um, my very nearly son-in-law came in here, he said, no curtains in the middle. He said, no curtains. He said, growth. And that's why I don't cover my windows. You say, that side and this side. Yeah. That's when it's in bloom. See, it's not in bloom at the moment, and that is why it looks so pretty. Yeah. It does look pretty, doesn't it? A lovely patch. And as I'm between two schools, the state school and the convent school, the children going past take great pleasure in picking these to give to their mother or to give to someone, even they'll give them to me if I'm out the front there. They love picking those and it gives pleasure to so many people. I like to help people, I, especially the old ladies. I like to help them. Uh, and, and in future, I, I think I'm not going to charge them anymore. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, I, I put in the papers that I'm going to charge them about $1. And this one dollar will go to the community. I was really pissed off. I'd only just got here, really, um, and was just starting to settle in and just starting to know people. And um, it, was, it was just, oh, God, not again, you know. Um, I'd been homeless, you see, and I'd gone through all sorts of um, in and out, I've been in, in and out of hospitals, etc., etc., and it was just. I finally, I finally had this little bit of a reprieve from all that, and felt that I could actually sort of had a solid base now. And it just seemed like um, that was to end before it had even begun. I had them on the first place, I'm not moving nowhere. I don't choose anything. They give me even a map, you know, to choose where I'm able to go. They offering us a house, anything, just move. But I don't want a house, I don't want nothing, I want to stay. Sometimes I think, well, it's inevitable, what the heck, you might as well accept it, you know, and just hope for the best. But then I think, no, why just roll over and let them do this when it isn't necessary, it's not going to improve anything. We have to fight. We have to say no. What if we all don't decide to go? What if we vacate the place, like in the history of Newtown in the 1930s, workers out of work, people couldn't pay the rent, 
and uh, the landlord had called the bailiffs in, they move all the furniture out, and then all of a sudden, no mobile phone contact in those days, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 people would turn up, move the furniture back in and tell the coppers to piss off. And that's recorded history of places like Newtown, Erskineville and Redfern. And we're prepared to do that. Already some people are talking about we're not prepared to go. If we just don't fight or just say it's inevitable, let's just go, we'll always be sorry that we didn't kick up a bit of a stink. And I think we should do our very best. We might win. The format for tonight's meeting basically is there'll be a, a couple of fairly short presentations. The first from Helen Wood from the Department of Housing, from the Housing Finance Investment Group. And Helen's job is basically just to give you a bit of background about the objectives of the master plan. And then Frank Stanisic will take you through in a bit more detail um, the urban context for this process and the opportunities and constraints and some of the early design principles that they're thinking about. Now the reason that we're, we've decided to renew this estate, the Minister has made this decision and it was announced about a month ago, um, Dr Rashogi, the Minister for um, Housing and Planning, uh, is because the estate is old. It was designed in the 1930s. It was built half before the war and half after the war. There is a scope to renew because it's a very low density estate in, in an inner city area. Um, and also, what, what the Department of Housing has is, is a client base, particularly on this estate which is very elderly, and those flats are not suitable for the elderly in the form that they're in at the moment. From the evening's a meeting we'll be having a summary report of the presentations given, the questions and answers, and we'll send that back to you within about 10 working days, providing you sign yourself in on the way in. So there'll be a record of this evening's meeting and discussion. But the, the website, which is set up through Elton Consulting's website, has got a project summary with detailed objectives on it, if anybody wants to look at that. And we'll be posting the material onto that website that you'll be seeing this evening. Any other questions or clarification about the process? Yeah. When you use the expression, work will start in two and a half years, does that uh, suggest that, irrespective of any opposition, that um, no change isn't one of the options uh, under consideration? I, well, I can't um, make that decision. I think mm. the only person who could probably stop it going ahead mm. would be the Minister. So, when we look at the site, um, our initial reaction is that of the things that are there, that the things that should be Firstly, the things that can go, uh, the, the current um, Department of Housing flats. And this is subject to a heritage study which is currently being ca uh, carried out. And we may find as a consequence of that heritage study that maybe some, some blocks need to be retained as representative of the old, of the old, the old estate. We don't know yet, but, but we'll be advised by that by, by a heritage architect. If I could just make a, a general comment from an independent point of view. That this is often a dilemma for these kind of consultation processes because if you wait until all these questions are answered, then you're actually involving people very late in the process. And if you go out early, as these people are, you go out with some rough numbers and some rough assumptions which need to be tested through the rigour of the process. So I guess because you're getting answers which are not precise tonight, people say, well, haven't you done your, your feasibility study? The answer is that you do that probably four or five times during the course of the process. Oh, the justification of all this is that the Housing Commission is short of money for rebuilding programs. They've got a 1.7 million billion, I think, maintenance bill. Now, I just use as example, and the council's got it now, a similar project up on Elizabeth Street, uh, Redfin. And on that basis, they had 105, 106 units. What they're going to do there, they're going to wipe that out and put 248 back. 148 or 46 or 2 will be private and the other 80 will be public. The densities are going to be greater. That's what they're telling you. My argument was a loss of public housing. You build all your, I call them rabbit warrants, that's what they'll be in a few years' time. We're going to have more population and there's no provision made for trains. Those people have got to get to work. They travel like cattle now. What's it going to be later? I'm totally blind. I've been that way since I was about four years old. And um, of course, when anybody 
whether you know when a when a person with who's got no sight moves into a new area um, you know they need to have lessons in in finding about their out about their surroundings learning how to get to essential places such as the station or the local shopping center so um, you know I organized that with um, guide dogs to come and teach me um, how to get to the places that, that I would frequent the most. We all have someone next door that we look after or someone we keep an eye on and uh, so that's good for the older residents and because long-term residents have been here so long they're actually becoming the older residents now themselves and uh, that's a good feeling to have that security. Um, when the department wanted us to wanted to evict us or threaten to evict us for progress, in the name of progress. Well, I can honestly say my mum probably aged about 10 years and so did a lot of the older members of the community with the worry of losing that security. And that security doesn't come from four walls and bricks and mortar. It comes from walking up the street safely doing a little bit of shopping safely, having a chat in the sunshine on the way, knowing what the neighbours are doing, if it's, you know, um, if it's worry, if it's something you can be worried about or, you know, being involved. And I think that's the threat of losing that social security, not her, was a lot for the older people to bear. Um, we lost a couple of people around that time. And who knows what that was attributed to. Oh, how did I feel? The same as I told the interviewer how I felt. I said, well, I'm not moving. He said, but you can't stay on the estate. It'll be too dusty for you and it'll be too noisy. I said, well, I'll get a mask for the dust. And they won't work all night, I don't think. Then he said, oh, well, that's your prerogative. I said, no, I'm not moving because if I move out of here, I may not come back here. And I've got to be here close to the specialists and that, that are under at Prince Alfred Medical Centre. Mixed feelings, actually, because usual department tactic and ploy is to dress it up so it's rather nice. Very, very, very favourable to people's eyes. But as time, and the other reaction was, oh, shift again, all that up, 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 because obviously one had to shift because the proposal was that their new dwellings being built. But what we didn't know, that they weren't necessarily all for us, unfortunately. As time went on, my, my uh, ideas and uh, knowledge of what was going on cemented. And it was just, as I said, and it, uh, it stirred a lot of people up to actually form groups to stop this. And, uh, we, and, and the community did get together with a lot of outside help as well. Next year we've got a state government election coming up and we need to put pressure on. But also, this is more than a local issue. I mean, there's people here today that I know walked through the school earlier that come from as far as Alice Street at, New, at Newtown and they've said to me, that they feel this is part of their community too. I know it as one of the quietest housing commission places there would be in New South Wales. Let's go back to the issue. The issue, as far as I'm concerned, that was a model design estate. Now, as far as I'm concerned, you can't get a better design. When you go inside the houses, my sister had eight children in one of the ones at the top. She, and she might have done it comfortably, there might have been a fair bit of traffic, but at least she did it comfortably enough. The Housing Commission, and I've been told, I haven't gone into this stupidly, have got problems in relation to providing for their waiting list, which is over 80,000. And I can feel very sorry for those people on a waiting list. Today, I'm supporting the retention of the estate as it is. There's no way they can replicate the uh, the conditions in those units there. We carried out a survey um, two weeks ago 
uh, to try to find out how public tenants felt about their estate and where they live. Now, the Department of Housing has been saying that the type of housing stock is not suitable. It's not what's required by the public tenants. And yet we find there is a great level of contentment with the estate just exactly the way it is. We interviewed a total of 55 people, which represents about uh, a third of the, the units on the estate. So do you support the Department of Housing plans for the estate? Yes, three. No, 46. We asked what's good about the estate. And with the, the typical responses we received, and these were, this wasn't tick a box, this was people writing their own comments. 30 people made comments along the lines of we've got good neighbours, we've got friendly neighbours, they watch out for each other, it's a friendly community. I'd like to thank everybody for coming here. In, I, I'm sure that a number of the property owners around the place are concerned about their pr property values with every good reason. However, I also feel that all the residents I have spoken to are also fully in support of the tenants in their struggle to keep the ERCO estate as it is. Erskineville is once again under siege. This time the New South Wales Labor government wants to demolish a perfectly functional housing estate and replace it with something triple its current size. This is an outrage. However, um, as Jan indicated today, I am here in my capacity as the treasurer for this school and I thank her for the opportunity of allowing me to um, tie the school in with this issue because they are both intrinsically connected. When we first started fighting for the school, the government assured us in writing that the school was not under review. Yet two months later, in March last year, the announcement of the proposed closure was made. This was the first lie that was told to us. Let me tell you that if you think New South Wales Labor has any intention of retaining this site, think again. When we met Education Minister John Watkins in July this year, he stated to us point blank that he would not be making a decision regarding this site until after the school closed at the end of the year. And yes, the school is closing at the end of the year. When we pressed him as to why, he stated that it would be disruptive to the students. Well, thank you for your consideration, Mr Watkins, but we think closing the school is disruptive to the students. Uh, here we go again, we've got another fight on. Uh, this one, I've been living in the area now for just over 10 years, and I think this is the most appalling plan I've seen so far. Um, it's pretty serious, and I have probably the most significant impact on um, Erskineville that you can imagine. It's, uh, it's bad social policy, it's bad town planning, it's bad housing policy. We've got the best public housing probably in New South Wales down there, and it's just not good enough for the state government to say, we haven't got the money, therefore we're going to sell this incredibly valuable real estate. We got a letter talking about a public forum, and when we, I went along to that first meeting, I was quite vocal, as were a couple of other people in the group, and we got together immediately after that meeting and started talking about what we were going to do. I like the idea of mixed uh, areas. I don't want to live in a selective area. So we, often, we went off to the public meetings that were organised, and they were organised along the lines of each street, not as a whole group. And I was immediately suspicious of that because I thought, why would they be organising it like that? And it was sort of like a divide and rule mentality that I, I, I had a, I've got a pretty good bullshit radar and I, I knew they were doing it that way for a reason. It first came to my attention when I actually heard it on the radio uh, and then saw it in the Sydney Morning Herald that uh, the state government was going to redevelop this housing estate. When I looked at the map, I saw it was across the road from where I was living, which is uh, right here. So. That was my, my first uh, introduction to it. And I was working at Newtown Neighbourhood Centre at the time. It just didn't make sense to me why you would actually start destroying an estate that was working so well with the community when we know that there are so many um, community housing projects or, you know, that are just not working. So the reasons that they gave for trying to pull it down and start again just didn't balance out with the cost that was going to come. Part of its charter of the Newtown Neighbourhood Centre is to help local residents in any sort of resident action campaign. There was no um, 
disharmony or anything for, for the great majority of the campaign. We'd, we'd have our little meetings and we'd have a plan about what we'd do, then we'd go into the next phase and we'd organise bigger public meetings, barbecues. We even had a stall at the Newtown Fair where we collected petitions and people from outside Erskineville who used to come here to go to the village, to the coffee shops and that, they were supportive of it. In terms of an increase in residents on the site, it would have gone from having, I think there's about 146 I think it was, um, units, it was going to increase to 600 units and there was only going to be an increase of four public housing units, so it was going to be 150, you know, uh, public housing units, but another 450 units, on, additional units on site. And the concrete and glass, Sydney's disappearance It's all good for profit and for plunder. Though we really want a state, they keep driving us away. Now across the western suburbs we must wander. Now before this city's wrecked, these developers must be checked. It's plain to see they do not give a bugger And we soon will see the day If these bandits have their way We'll all be shifted out past Wagga Wagga Under concrete and glass Sydney's disappearing fast It's all gone for profit and for plunder Though we really want to stay They keep driving us away Across the western suburbs we must walk why we're here today is solidarity with the tenants of this estate. I live on Binning Street and I moved here two and a half years ago because I saw that this was a good community. What I think has happened is that the government thought that this was an easy sell-off and that the tenants would go quietly. That will not happen. The branches right across the board within that area, Labor branches were coming out and saying there is a problem and I think if nothing else is learned by our party, I think the one thing that is now being learned and learned very clearly Thanks is that you learn. have to learn to listen. You have to listen to your branch members, you have to listen to the community. This is your last chance, one last call. So if you haven't bought a raffle ticket, we'll, we'll buy it now. What's happening is on Tuesday morning, we've organised a meeting with the Minister for Housing, Andrew Ref Shorgi. At the meeting we'll be delivering this letter, it goes for three pages, it outlines pretty much all the opposition against the proposed redevelopment. We believe the Erskineville estate is a model for public housing, the residents are truly integrated into the fabric of the Erskineville community and enhance its diversity. It is clear that the integration of our community is facilitated by the open design of the existing estate. The housing department refers to the estate as being underdeveloped which we feel is as good as saying public housing tenants have too much parkland and open space. It's too good for them. Do people generally agree with those sentiments? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's pretty much the There were six of us, three tenants and three others, went to see Dr. of Shorgi in at Parliament House. And so then he said, I'd like to meet some more tenants. We just have a meeting first with Dr. of Shorgi, uh, secretary and we cried and we tell her everything what we feeling and uh, I think she's shocked very much and she she feel the same like us you know sad he couldn't make it that day and she took his place there and uh, I said well I don't know about you people but I said, I, more or less, I've been in this place ever since it's been built. I've had some wonderful times here. I've met some wonderful people here, a lot, lot of beautiful friends. I said, you tell Dr. Rev Sorky, if he wants me out of this place, he can carry me out or drag me out, but I will not bloody well walk out. We sort of had a feeling of uh, a bit of uplifting, but we weren't sure. We just weren't sure. And so they called, they listened to us all talk around the table. Um, or she did, uh, Fran, and as, as the time went on, she listened to everybody. She then picked out certain people who she asked would they write something down about why... Uh, just off hat, I can't think exactly what the question was, um, why we wanted to remain and such sort of... So when we went back to the second meeting and Dr Rishorgi was there, 
we all spoke our little bit around the table and um, we sat there, it was a very quiet, very sombre sort of a meeting. Nobody was actually sure, I don't think, what was going to happen and then when those lovely words came out, it was just sheer relief. I think there was a few tears around and um, it was a tremendous burden. I think when we walked home, I thought I was walking on air when I walked back to my unit. He said, it's all over. It's not going to happen. That's it. End of, end of the, uh, the whole business. So we were all very, very happy. And I have to admit, I did breathe a sigh of relief because I was thinking, oh my goodness, you know, the moving, the, the this, the that, the whatever. You know, we all got to say, you know, how we felt about it, express our thanks. And um, at the end of the meeting, just as I was leaving, um, he gave me a kiss on the cheek. That's all it was. <laughs> the day the minister came down here and he was in the little uh, room over here and those people told him his story, he was quite sincere. He hadn't made up his mind. He was, um, he was still he knowing all the stories we told him and that. But I genuinely think that those people did make an appeal to him that day and he made up his mind he wasn't going to go any further. We got immediate support from all the local branches, from Erskineville, from Newtown, from Alexandria. Um, we started corresponding with um, uh, Andrew Refshorgi, um immediately uh, and uh, I, one of the things I did was make a point of showing uh, t or trying to demonstrate to him the depth of feeling. Um, one of the issues that was very uh, powerful lever to use with the Labor Party was the fact that uh, the Democrats and the Greens were getting heavily involved in the campaign and making all uh, the right sort of noises. The big one that was happening at the same time as us was the school. So the closure of the, of the school that was also fought against and won. So it was a big fill up to us when that actually occurred. And I suppose at the same time that was happening with Callan Park and the fact that public, that private voices joined together can make a difference. As you know, you've been invited here today to talk about setting up a tenant group. Um, there was, I've met with some tenants previously to this and you know they thought it would be a good idea to um, start a tenant group, but how about invite a whole heap of people to come along and let's actually talk about it. Talk about what this tenant group would look like and talk about what the tenant group would do. So I'm basically here to help facilitate that to happen. So let me just pass around a little really simple information sheet on what a tenant group is. And I'm also gonna pass around basically what, what I usually work off with tenant groups when, when they're first starting. So the first time a group of people meet, this is usually the guide that I use to help the group set up. And it's certainly what I'll be doing today and the questions I'll be asking you and helping you to answer. You guys obviously came along to, today with an idea in your head of why you want to form a tenants group. Now, we used to have a tenants group. I don't know how long it is since it met. And then it kind of fell apart and nothing happened until the department wanted to pull our buildings down. And then we were up in arms and so were the residents around the place. And so there was a group form which comprised both. However, um, we feel that we want to um, manage our affairs rather than have them manage for us. To have a group that, that has a voice to liaise with DRH. Basically the next step in, in the process that I, I go through with groups is actually setting your aims thinking about what you want to achieve. But we all support each other and we are a, an established group. We might be able to get more things done, for instance, following through with maintenance things that are promised but not done, that sort of thing. So we've started our own newsletter. It's only one sheet and on the reverse are the minutes of or every meeting so that those who couldn't come to the meeting know what happened. And on the front are all the other little bits and pieces that, that seem interesting that month. Work should be inspected. Dennis will invite Christine Keneally to one of our meetings if the department does not respond to our letter. I did attend a workshop or a tennis conference Tuesday and Wednesday and I was actually able to speak to Mike Allen in person and also the minister, Mr Scully. Ooh. And uh, I berated Scully, you know, about 
his comments in the newspaper. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I said, we are very alarmed because, I mean, what happened before and all the things that went down and the department lied to the, the previous minister yeah. about our, our approval to, to bulldoze this area. And I said, we are very alarmed and people are very, still very scared about losing their homes. And he said to me, and I had a couple of witnesses there, that there is no intention of the department to touch Erskineville Estate. There's an old saying that verbal undertakings are not worth the paper they're not written true. on. Not true. Apart from just having a voice for all the tenants, we want to make sure that we never go through that terrible fear again of having our houses knocked down. And so we're going to pursue the best possible heritage cover we can get. Um, and to this, to this end, um, we have made contact with various people, not even necessarily tenants, but people who are interested in heritage and who are interested in this estate. Buildings and sites that are on, on this uh, register and their significance had to be established before it could go on. It, if anybody puts in a development application, uh, it's immediately flagged that it is a heritage item. Mm -hmm. And so um, I suppose it, it, it doesn't mean that uh, if, if somebody wants to demolish something that it automatically is not permitted. But I, I gather that if, if this is the case, uh, it has to automatically be sent to the Heritage Office of New South Wales. All the routes of contact with Heritage listing the National Trust, etc., have all said you must have it on the council listing first. But National Trust has half of it registered, registered as, I don't know what it's registered as, it's just classified. So the north half is already registered by the Whatever. Trust. Riverwood Inside News, big paper. <laughs> it's, it's got a copy of our story about the tree. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, there you go. Did you copyright it? <laughs> no worries, mate. <laughs> yes. For the present day history, I've got the last four copies of the Echo Echo. Right? So, there you are. Well, we were keen to get the entire estate heritage listed, but when we found out that only the top part could be the part that was built in 1938 and not the bottom part that was built in 1948, then we decided to drop the whole thing because we, we thought the whole estate should be heritage listed or it wasn't worth doing at all. Because the withdrawal of funding was so severe over the years of the Howard government, um, it is simply not possible to turn the clock back and return to a public housing system like we used to have. The amount of dollars required now is formidable, so that even though we've had the economic stimulus package that's put a lot of money into the system for the next two years, the governments would have to continue to put that sort of money and more into the system for the next 10 years to make up for the damage that was done in those 10 in the years of the Howard government. I think they're going to create a lot more problems by tearing down what's already working and starting again um, because communities are destroyed by redevelopment. They're uprooted and destroyed. You can't replace that. It takes three generation, generations and 50 years. So maybe in three generations and 50 years, you know, maybe there will be a nice, a nice um, community in that type of housing development, but that's how long it's going to take. It's just the way human beings work together. And I see that we're working together here, not working against each other. And in a new development, that's not always the case, when there's unfamiliar ground. One of the things with both Erskineville and Minto that the Minister of the Day neglected to do was to consider that the housing that he was talking about was housing lived in by people for whom it was home and he failed to negotiate or talk with them about what it was, what the issues were and what role they may or may not play with 
in it and what role in any redevelopment they could play in shaping the nature of the community that would be built there or whatever. There was no consultation with the tenants. We've still got great concerns that the estate could be sold off. We, we had a guarantee from, personal guarantee from Dr Reshorgi that he would always protect the estate, but you know, politicians come and go. This is a safe Labor seat. If the Liberal Party gets in, we, we still could lose and we're, we're prepared to fight. Now this estate originally was planned as a park setting for healthy living in the 30s for poor people. And it still is. The previous Minister for Housing, Dr. Shorgi, said it was the best estate that they had. And the atmosphere here was friendly and nice and he didn't want to interfere with it in any way at all, but to preserve it. And now we're facing, again, government plans to tear it down. What struck me was that the public housing uh, component of it was only going to increase by about half a dozen units or something like that. It was basically just handing over a prime piece of real estate to a developer to make a lot of money and the private part of it was going to do very nicely out of it and the public was going to gain very little from the process. The whole concept of public-private infrastructure uh, to me is just another way of selling off public assets to uh, private companies. You know. Uh, what more can I say about it? It stinks. This uh, little number is dedicated to all the battlers, the mates and comrades who helped us out in the campaign to knock Andrew Ripshulky's ideas or the County Commission's ideas off. You don't mind me saying that. And it goes like this. It's called mates. The poor help the poor and the rich help themselves. And you only get sad pack from pixies and elves. The rich help themselves, I'll tell you dead set, those mongrels rip us off for all they can get. But under the surface of what is apparent, there are those who reject class titles inherent, of the spawn of the Packers and Murdochs and such, and other spin doctors who talk double dutch. But we're not the deals they take us to be. We know two and two just doesn't make three. As our poets before spoke of mateships in rhymes, the mates of today keep in step with the times. They suss out the bludgeons that scab spies and such scum. But if you're a battler, I'll give you the drum. With no arse in your pants or a quid to your name, They'll reach down and grab you, so you're living again. So here's to the battlers, the comrades and mates, whose lives are entangled in each other's fates. When the shit hits the fan and you're copping the lot, that's when you know who's fair dinkum or not. Yeah.